Well, good afternoon everyone again. My name is John Paul. I'm a member of this community actually since birth and also a member of the organizing committee for this Justice Conference. So this morning, we heard our local voices talking about historical and present injustices in the First Nations community, as well as in the Indo-Canadian community. In this context, we learned that human beings created in the image of God are designed for the purpose of walking in harmony with each other and with their Creator. So this afternoon we are so pleased and honoured to welcome a panel of persons who are involved with the questions of homelessness and residential stability in our own community. And in turn, I would like to ask each one of you to tell us briefly about yourself and your organization and your involvement with homelessness. Yes, I'm uh, Lee Olar. I uh, sit on the Board of Citizens for Public Justice, which is an organization which is born in the cradle of the Christian Reformed Church with a lot of other social organizations. Uh, like I said, it just had its 50th anniversary, and I sit on the board of that. And uh, for me, it's been a pleasure to be here because this is a conversation that deepens our thoughts about justice. And CPJ was one of those organizations which began, which was committed to seek uh, human flourishing, and uh, it envisions a world in which individuals, communities, and social institutions, and churches, and governments um, are aware of a hurting world, and we want to advance the call and or to promote uh, public justice in Canada by shaping key policy. It's an organization based in uh, Ottawa, but it used to have offices here in BC. It uh, sets the national policy, but it's also involved in uh, setting policies also on, uh, on housing, public housing, on, uh, on income distribution, dealing with poverty, all related and integrated. My name is Nate Cree. I am the new director of community ministries of the Salvation Army in the Center of Hope. I have been a client of the Salvation Army at one time about 15 years ago, and I'm a director there, so it's kind of my experience that God does exist. Uh, I have a background in homelessness. I've worked in homelessness for about 10 years now with youth and adults, uh, mainly through the lens of minimal barrier and harm reduction. And the Salvation Army does exist to share the love of Jesus Christ, meet basic human needs, be a transforming influence in the community. We do that through a lot of different programs. We have counseling, shelter, supported independent living, meal center, outreach, site nurse, LPN. There's, there's a lot of different things happening at the center, so that's what we do. Hello, everybody. My name is Barbara. Um, I worked at, at Mission Mental Health for about 30 years, and uh, I'm actually retired, sort of, uh, and working right now with uh, an outreach population, generally people who are homeless, uh, in, at Abbotsford Mental Health. And uh, so, you know, at the moment I'm looking for housing for about five people. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, a lot of the people deal with have reached the point of um, addictions where they are out of, out of the house. And at that point, they probably need some help. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Dirksen, and I'm representing Abbotsford Community Services. And unless you've been living under a rock, you know that we've been quite involved with the issue of homelessness over the last few months. So Abbotsford Community Services is a long-standing not-for-profit agency. We're not faith-based, but many of our um, employees are, are have faith in their lives. Um, and so we have about 80 different programs that are funded by the provincial government, by the federal government, uh, lots of fundraising and, and uh, foundations. We provide services like food bank, um, services for seniors, for kids, victim services, mental health, addictions. So it's a wide range of services. 
Um, we recently um, became involved with homelessness um, and, and wanting to provide shelter for 20 men who are homeless or at risk of homelessness and have multiple barriers to housing, like addictions or mental health. Um, so that's, that's really where um, my interest has been in the last few months. Now I've recently retired from ACS, but they haven't let me leave, um, and I've been working on the homelessness issue for some time. Um, in my private life, I am a member of Emmanuel Mennonite Church, and have had many leadership positions, and currently am a deacon there, and we're very much involved with the Extreme Weather Shelter, which some of you may know about. It's, it happens once the temperature hits freezing, and different churches take turns providing services, um, and we are also work together with the Salvation Army to take the first sort of load, and then um, the churches will take up to, you know, up, we can take up to 20 people. So my, my you know, my um, involvement with homelessness has been both professional and personal. My name is Bob Workinshaw, I'm a member of this church. I'm a volunteer at Joshua House. Um, started just volunteering in the homes, mentoring in Bible studies, and now I'm chairman of the board. Uh, Joshua House works with, is a Christian organization working with men in recovery. Uh, we know that addictions and homelessness are not the same thing, but we know there's a lot of connections between them. Um, Joshua House's approach is absent based, a 12 step program. We have three homes. Until this month, we had 25 capacity for 25 in three homes. We also had a farm, which you can read the news. We gained a zoning for it, then lost through lease issues. Um, that would have added 20 more beds, but out of that, um, we had an offer of a larger home to rent, so we just upgraded from one of the, our smallest home to a, a larger one, so we now have 30 beds as of this coming week. Um, three, three stages, entry, and then middle, and then a senior for those who want to stay, they're, they're unsure of housing afterwards, they're wanting to gain a foot in schooling or working, and so now we have 10 beds for them in that senior stage after the program. I'm Warren Draper, Executive Director and Founder of uh, Five and Two Ministries. Uh, we do uh, work with the homeless quite a bit. It is a significant portion of the work we do. We provide services six days a week in Abbotsford uh, for outreach and support services. Our primary focus is people keep people alive until we have some final long-term solutions like we lost with ACS. Um, we currently, the type of work we do is from our service range has been from clipping toenails to uh, helping re uh, rewrite policy and law that uh, deal with poverty and addiction issues. Uh, we also do things like uh, harm reduction services and provide needle exchange for persons living in addiction, uh, among many other things. And we also operate a uh, coffee night once we can like it as well and some other miscellaneous things. Thank you very much and uh, we want to welcome all of you. As, as Kathy alluded to, recent events in Abbotsford has certainly drawn increased attention to our homeless population. I guess it didn't start just recently. Um, but decisions by our community, including our faith community, either to get involved or to not get involved affects each one of us in our community. So, in, in the faith community in particular, you know, we hear so many things. We hear so many things in the news and in the media and on blogs, and um, so we we want to do more. So the question then is for each of you: in addressing the needs for, or in addressing needs for food and shelter, how else can we foster dignity and respect for all members of the community, including our homeless? Well, I think the simplest response, especially coming from the church end of things, the easiest and most practical, immediate response that we can give is take these buildings that we're sitting in today and open your front door and just turn it into a coffee shop. Make it a community center and just welcome whoever's around and start from there. And let that community, wherever you may lie, dictate your next steps. So the first and most immediate practical response is just turning this into an actual community center around the block. That goes for every building in this town that claims Christ. Thank you. 
Well, um, you know, I, I have been involved with um, social service agencies and social justice issues for all my career, and also been involved in church. And one of the things that I've tried to do uh, in my church is, is eliminate the fear factor. So many people, I think, have a heart and want to do something, but they're, they don't know where to go or what to do. They want to make it meaningful, um, but you know, they don't know where to plug in. So I think one of the things that I've tried to do with, with my congregation is, is to provide opportunities for people to, to engage. And I think when you engage with anyone, and especially the homeless, who you know present this image of um, you know roughness, dirty, smelly, um, talking to themselves, you know dangerous. Um, you know once you once you kind of develop a relationship or ask them questions or talk to them, you know most of them have a story will will relate to you, um, and and the fear factor disappears. And we've done that through at Emmanuel now. We were involved with extreme weather for, I think this is our fifth year, and that was the biggest thing, the fear factor. Like, what, do, how, what do I say to them? You know, like, I don't have a degree to deal with them. You don't need a, a degree to, to deal with people one-to-one. -one. You know, we provide the basic shelter, you know, a mat, a sleeping bag, snacks, you know, maybe TV, um, a great breakfast, lunch, and the opportunity to sit down and just talk to someone. Um, you know, we've had, had amazing stories from people. Um, we, people come in and do haircuts. Um, you know, and often the homeless just want to come in and they want to go right to bed because they're tired. Um, so that's what I've tried to do um, within um, my congregation is just to, to eliminate the gear factor, provide opportunities for people to interact. I would agree with that. So. And in recovery, there's a lot of fear. What are these people like? And I've learned a little bit from their perspective. They have felt that their choices and their background and everything has marginalized them. And they're so amazed if somebody wants to be friends. But they call us normies. That if somebody actually wants to come alongside and partner and befriend, that really speaks a lot to them. But in terms of the question of the dignity, what strikes me besides that is for them, they're recovering. What the recovery is. It's so important. They work together in these homes for it. And I think the reason why is they've known what they've lost. Jobs, homes, and especially families. I've been so moved when they become clean, when they're talking about their family, their children, or sometimes a parent. And then when they're clean long enough and build a track record, you can actually see some restoration uh, for them and for anybody involved. This is very good. I mean, we've got some stories in the back of our booth is in the back of just written out some of the stories of men and uh, reconnecting and gaining the trust of their family again. That's huge for their dignity as well as things like jobs. Um, mostly I have worked with people who have a mental illness, but many of them were homeless before they, they got the help that they needed. Uh, in my private life, one of the things that I do is uh, coordinate a, a program called Partnership. Uh, with the BC Schizophrenia Society. And what we do is we have people who have a lived experience of mental illness who come to a variety of different groups and, and tell their story. And the reality is, is that many of the people, when they get to the point of being homeless uh, because of drug or alcohol addiction, probably have a mental illness and need help in that way. Um, and I know that we sit around, there aren't just drunks or druggies. I mean, they're, they're using that stuff because the alternative hurts too bad. And so um, I think that, that um, we, again, somebody said something about fear, okay? And when you hear people's stories, you realize there is nothing to fear. And if, they're, if their basic need, needs are met, you don't have to worry about the criminality as well. So those kinds of things tend to go away. 
Well, I guess for myself, looking at this question around the dignity and respect, there's a couple of things that have already been said. The relationship building is very important. I think another thing that we sometimes miss is when we're providing services, is ask the people who are receiving the services what services they need. You know, what is it that you would like from us? What do you need us to do? I think that's important. And the other thing, and this comes from a little bit of my time as a client, is the standing in line. There is nothing less dignified than standing in line for your meal when people drive by. You know, if there's a way to avoid that, if there's a way, even to bring people inside the building to stand in line, there's more dignity than having to stand outside. Uh, that is that is a hard thing. Any service provider will tell you that you know, if you're going to be providing meals to 100 people, 150 people, there has to be some structure. This is when we open. But the thing that I try to look for, and, and in Salvation Army right now, we're looking at ourselves internally. And what can we do? What are the barriers that are perhaps present within with our own system that we can look at? And that's one of the things I am looking at: is how to cut down on the standing in line and you know, just restoring some dignity there. Just come in, sit down, and, and at some point we get your meal together. You know, but it's better than standing in the rain. It's better than standing in a rope to drive by. So that was a big thing for me when I looked at this. The dignity question was the big one by us. I represent an organization which is, as I said, located in Ottawa. It's a national organization. And uh, so the committee asked me if I would sit up here in the panel, and I said, I really have nothing to say specifically to the Abbotsford question. However, they said it's part of a bigger issue, and that's uh, under uh, that proviso. I, uh, I think it's important to know that this is part of a bigger discussion because doing justice is about making things right. And as we talk about uh, advancing in society through local, active, fearless love for others, as we have heard about. And um, to be part of a faith-based organization which is trying to shape public policy where you deal with homelessness, where you deal with poverty, you deal with uh, alienation, marginalization, and as we heard some of the speakers say, um, and CPJ really, the Citizens for Public Justice, advocates that we have to, we, we applaud those issues like five and two and the others who are sitting up here who do things immediately, who provide, who provide for people. And as we have the speakers say, we gotta do something. But this is also part of a systemic issue, as you hear Jim Wallace say, we have to deal with other issues and, uh, and how do we create national housing strategies? Uh, how do we advocate uh, and advance causes? And our province uh, just adopted a budget uh, recently and um, we live in a democracy and yet we know child poverty, for example, is part of the poverty issue. Is uh, BC is the highest or lowest, again, if you want to, our numbers are are out of line with even the rest of the nation. And this current budget did nothing to that. I think we, as a local community, have to be involved and say, yes, we have these issues to address, of which we have manifestations locally as well, that we have uh, some brokenness right here. And I, I applaud the fearlessness with which some of the organizations here are acting. Thank you. What an incredible resource of uh, experience that we have here. So thank you very much. So the, the, question, the next question is somewhat related to that, but it's, it's the time to dream and to vision. Um, can you share your vision for how our community can participate in residential stability for all persons? And so it's, it goes beyond homelessness, and as Lee had mentioned, but it's sort of, this is the, now the time to dream. So let's get beyond the specific issues dream of, of the Shalom community of, of making things right. We'll pass, continue to pass the mics back and forth. Um, one of the things I think, let's start again uh, from large to small, meta to specific. Uh, for instance, uh, Canada used to have a housing strategy and there was a, a bill C-400, you may recall, which was advocated a few years ago, which was private members bill. And uh, this, uh, the housing has removed, we don't even have a housing ministry anymore uh, in, in Ottawa. So it says, as a nation, we 
have marginalized this whole question, and we have downloaded it to all of the local agencies, essentially, to deal with it. And I think that's a, that's a national embarrassment and abrogation. I think we have a responsibility to advocate, as Wallace says, in the U.S. to deal with immigration. I think we have to deal with poverty and housing in Canada. And, you know, that bill was, uh, was proposed. It was a private member's bill. Uh, it, was, uh, it had all party support. However, the government of the day assumed uh, that, uh, that, that uh, they made it a whipped vote, which means it had more along party lines. And it had little to do with the convictions of, of uh, MPs. And I think that the MPs from this area, uh, had they had the freedom to do that, we may have had some legislation today. I would like to think we would. I think we have to reawaken and uh, reinitiate those kinds of things as well. We deal with uh, our own province. Uh, talk to uh, uh, Mr. DeYoung uh, about uh, you know the whole issue of child poverty. So looking at this, I guess for myself, what I would like to see if it's my sort of dream world thing, I would like to see a lot more frontline service. I think that the uh, Services are lacking on how we're going to get people into service in the first place. Like, where do we need people to be out there? Um, and not just the street. What about seniors that are living in poverty? You know, if we're looking at housing overall, what about the seniors who are trying to make it on a very small pension? Uh, what about single moms for kids? You know, um, again, single income, living off of income assistance, which really doesn't go very far. And how do we reach those people? I think I would like to see frontline services that are very diverse and bringing people in and then bringing them into wraparound service, bringing them to well supported housing that is, again, a wraparound service. If you have a mental health issue, go deal with the mental health issue. We'll get you the help. If it's addiction, we'll help you with addiction. If it's poverty and learning some life skills, getting education will help you with that. I think that often when looking at the issues of, of homelessness, we do miss that there is to general poverty, and we need to look at that, getting help to those people as well. They can often be hard to reach. Um, not a lot of people want to step up and say, I'm not supporting my kids well, or I'm not doing well in the grocery department, or I can't manage my money. So it's very difficult to get out there and bring those people in. So I have a sort of a wide range. I would like to see a little more down at the grassroots level and uh, a whole lot more support of supportive progress. Well, um, I work in this community, but I, I live in Chilliwack. And Chilliwack uh, Council has, is, I would say, probably the direct opposite of, of the council here. Uh, they've been very, very positive at providing uh, for, um, you know, housing for, for people. They have a one-stop shop uh, center for um, people with drugs and there and I, would, I I wrote them and asked them what what it was that made them so positive um, and that they haven't gotten back to me yet which is unfortunate but I, I guess the one thing maybe you can do if you feel strongly about uh, this issue is um, vote that way in your next municipal election <laughs> political I think we have to get political. Um, you know, I think we need leaders. We need leadership. We need fearless leadership. Um, I agree with, you know, my colleagues over here. You know, we need a national strategy. We need a provincial strategy instead of, you know, the, the, national, the government, federal government pointing that way and provincial government pointing that way. You know, um, because I think a lot of people know what, what the answers could be. Um, as social services agencies, we know what best practices are. Um, but yet, you know, we're, we're often applying for, for funding that's piecemeal. We know we really need to do this kind of service, a wraparound service, but yet, you know, there's only funding for this little piece. Um, so, so that is really, we need to have a consistent, um, streamlined service for people who are dealing with all kinds of issues. Um, you know, I would like to see um, sh more shelters where people can come in and um, 
support workers attached to that shelter because relationship building is one of the key things to getting people um, into housing or more stable housing. It's not just providing one apartment for a person. You know, sometimes it's, it's really working hard to bring that person in. I know one of the gentlemen that um, has come in, I don't know if anybody remembers Joe, who used to sit all over the city um, in, you know, minus 10 degree weather. He would not come in. He was, he was, I think Salvation Army often went to see him a couple of times a day when it was really bad weather. He wouldn't come in. Finally, a citizen, a woman with a young family, you know, decided she was going to spend some time talking to him, not just give him coffee. She built a relationship with him. Finally, he trusted her. She brought him in to see a counselor at community services. He wouldn't come in for the first couple of times. Finally, he came in. He, he, we found out his real name. He got um, hooked up with CPP and OAS, got $12,000 back pay. We put him into a, a home where he was, it was a living, living situation where he got room and board. He is now living independently, and this woman still connects with him um, to, to maintain that relationship. So I think that's one of the things that we can do as individuals. I think one thing we have to do, and hopefully you don't think I'm deconstructing the question, that if we think of the whole problem, it's going to be overwhelming. And I think we have to say that there are pieces we can get involved in, whether it's systemic, national, federal, <coughs> or municipal, okay. <laughs> um, or, or aspects of the problem of the grassroots and organizational level. Because if we think we can solve the whole thing by ourselves, you get to overwhelm. So finding the place. And then working at one's calling. But then the key is partnerships. I've not been on the board of Josh as long, but what's impressed me is the need for individuals who want a partnership with men and in a, in a mentorship and a, in a partnership there. Individuals who want a partnership organizationally. We need an individual who has a farm that would like us to use. <laughs> we could get 20 more beds at virtually no public cost <laughs> if we could just find our 10 beds. Individuals at that level, uh, partnerships with uh, uh, other organizations. This has been useful just to link with some of the other agencies and recognize that we're looking at we're working with these slightly different mandates, but we can be helping back and forth and referring uh, partnerships with churches, churches that can come alongside and take some aspect of the work along. The city, um, you know, it was very slow. It was two and a half years getting the farm rezoned. There's no ill will. Stuff just puckered in the staff and got shuffled back and forth, back and forth, until Angie, the executive director, and I made an appointment. And we sat with the people, called in our senior manager, who I happen to know from years ago, I taught him. And we, it's kind of like a partnership formed, and what had taken two years and three months at that point only took two months to get the zoning through. So partnerships all over where we work together um, is absolutely critical. And we will see. Uh, yes, we will see defeats, but we will then hopefully see more victories than defeats. Hmm. I'll bring it up. <laughs> no, you know, sitting here, I mean, there's so much validity in uh, the commentary and the statements made for ideal, for the effort for ideas for moving forward to address housing strategies or community development strategies or whatever it may be. Uh, but for me, when I, when I think about these issues, uh, any related issues to marginalized groups, uh, you know, disconnection of, you know, people, all those kind of, all the social issues that we have that are growing exponentially. For me, the one thing that I will probably, well, I'm going to definitely die ranting on this over and over again is that, again, like I said at the beginning, this space here and other spaces in our community uh, and I'm not saying that this one particularly is, but we do know that it is the, the norm is that churches have turned into social clubs and spiritual masturbation centers. They are becoming entertainment centers and not spiritual hospitals, bringing the restoration that our communities need and our neighbors need. It is our job as followers of Christ just to open our doors 
and to start immediately addressing the issues that are everywhere and raging out of control across this planet. If you want to address housing, churches like this and other ones, and just because I'm here, as an example, folks, but how many rooms in here could we convert to an apartment? How many mobile homes could you put on this property? We serve a God that has all power, control, and finances on this planet. What is a puny little person like Bruce going to say against our God? Stand up and fight. Stop operating on the world systems. Operate on kingdom systems. Well, thank you for that challenge, all of you. I'm going to oh, sorry, Kathy, yeah. telling you. Rally, Monday, City Hall, noon, show up, peaceful rally, tell them what we think. Support the housing. Awesome. Well, let's open up the floor to questions. Um, can somebody run around with the mic? So you may, tar you may ask your questions to one of the panel members individually or generally as a group. Hi. Um, I'm kind of on both sides of the opinion spectrum in the downtown Abbotsford. Um, I once was a single mom. I was on income assistance. I understand how difficult that is. I've organized fundraisers and collected warm items and taken it to people on the streets. But right now, I work in the downtown Abbotsford, historical downtown, whatever. And I live two blocks, or a few blocks away. And unfortunately, I find talking specifically about the occupation of Jubilee Park and uh, up and down uh, Cyril or whatever it's called, um, whatever section. Um, <clears throat> I have a difficult time supporting these people because of the negative things that they have done. One thing that has not been widely publicized is they have come in to, led by Tim Felger, into our businesses when there's just a single woman working, like myself, my job is just one woman working at a time. We can be totally alone and they come in and they started yelling and screaming and harassing us. It's very, very scary for me to have to go to work. When I go to work, we have a double stairwell, one goes up, one goes down. We often have people hiding in there. We have, we've had damage, we've had theft, we've had harassment. And I don't think it's fair that I should have to go to work under those circumstances. And then these people are asking me to support them. And I don't think it's fair if you want to make a, have a homeless camp to choose a, the entire park. There's an empty lot, there's lots of green space that they set up right next to a children's playground and defecate leaf needles there. So it makes it really, really difficult for me to back this whole movement and, and to know where to stand and what, you know, who to support and how to support it. Yes, I want, I want, I don't want them to be homeless. Yes, I do want you, them to have Excuse me, do you help. have a specific question? Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here because okay. I'm torn on how do I, how do I support when I'm being abused? It's, I think the, I think the question that's almost being raised here is, is how do we foster dignity in our community and it goes both ways. It's not just talking about dignity for the, for the, for the homeless, it's dignity for the entire community and, and we have an example addressed here. So if we can just uh, restrict to one minute per question and answer that allows a little bit more um, interaction. I, I, I would also feel that way if I was in your shoes. I mean, I do not support the kind of behavior that happens. I, I can't control that kind of behavior. Um, you know, what, what we at ACS had, we had a small piece of land which we would build housing on for 20 people who want to come in and want to make some changes in their lives. You know, I think that, um, I mean, one of the things that we would support with with those 20 people in, in housing, would be there would be people who would work with them. I mean, they would be under sort of 24 seven supervision, which is not what's happening now. Um, and also when people feel that this space is theirs, a, a house, and this, this, street, this area is their community, they will take some pride in it and, and ownership of it. And I would hope then that that kind of behavior would stop. Um, 
you know, the homeless are not going to go anywhere. We, right now, we're <coughs> shuffling them all over the place. And so they're, they're going to stay there. You know, there is no other alternative for them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Yes. If there's time, we can come back to it later, but yeah. um, let's try I really to want to follow on the theme of what the person over here just spoke about, because I think it's important, and I don't think we've unpacked a really important piece of what she was trying to get at. And that is that, in terms of what you just said, you talked about that there are people who really want to move forward in their lives. They can enter a program like that, get the kind of wraparound support that will help them reach their goals. That's really, really valuable. My agency is also working on that for people leaving prison who are dealing with homelessness, addictions, and mental health issues. But how do we as a society address those who are engaging in antisocial destructive behaviors, who don't show willingness to be accountable for their choices, who are engaging in things that are harassing, criminal acts, whatever. To me, that's a different category than those who are saying, I hate where I'm at, I've got to move forward, help me out of this, and I have goals. So it seems like we have different types of homeless people with different attitudes, okay? So how do you address those who are being quite antisocial and engaging in criminality? Well, it's like we have to engage anybody. Everyone's an individual. And when you're dealing with people that are super entrenched and say the ones that are more dangerous or the bad guys, what we have found is, through our work, is we, find people who are inadequate, uh, with strength and wisdom and knowledge to enter into the darkest places possible that those people possess and love them out of it. It takes a special type of courage and we have to find leaders that will train more people to enter that level of darkness to pull people out. Can you give us some examples of how that has worked and some demonstrated successes in that yeah, regard? Yeah, I can do that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you've got examples too. <laughs> Uh, so I can't speak about Abbotsford, but I can speak about my experience uh, working with this type of situation in Vancouver. So in Vancouver, I was manager for a 71-bed shelter combined with a 36-bed transitional housing community. So we had over 100 people there. And the NIMBY people, and not my backyard people, did a report on our neighborhood. And they, they ran a report on all the business they did not want in the neighborhood. We were not one of them. They didn't even know we were there. We were somewhat invisible. Uh, as has already been alluded to, staffing makes a huge difference. Knowing people makes a huge difference. The relationship that gets built with, built with inside the walls of the building. Uh, we, we got to know people, we worked with them. <coughs> <That makes sense. laughs> we got to know people, we worked with them, and we did from time to time have to look at folks and say, sorry, this is not the right program for you. And we do need to. Thank you for all your comments. I guess working in mental health as a social worker too, I just want to be a voice for all the people with persistent mental illness who, due to living on disability and many challenges, have such difficulty finding housing. We haven't had new low rental housing coming into our communities for a long time. I would just like to mention that one thing that I would like to see in terms of kingdom citizenship is more contractors coming up and saying, you know what, I can build housing that even I'm not going to make a lot of money on. And so that's one strategy. The other thing is I want to talk about circles of care. And um, in a number of communities, circles of care is where a person who has, and I call it residential stability, which is because it can be different kinds of housing. There are people who have a roof over their head, but it's horrible. So they still need improved housing. So there are some uh, communities that use uh, circles of care where the person who's the driver is the person looking for improved housing. People in communities um, can uh, circle around and they can choose to have people mentor them for over a year. I wonder if anyone wants to talk about circles of care. Somebody want to address? Uh, so you're, are you asking about anyone wants to address the, the concept of circle of care? 
I mean, I think it's a great concept. Um, and that is one, like, I mean, Ward pitch that, you know, get, building a relationship with even the most hardcore individuals and trying to sort of unpeel some of the layers that create that hostility and, and awful behavior. Um, I think building a relationship is critical. But, you know, we, if we, most governments, our social service agencies, don't fund that kind of intensive um, circle of care work, which, you know, is really where it's at. Um, so we need possibly the community to step in and do that. But I think the communities are all afraid to do that. Yeah, fear is great. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, a great example too. I mean, one of my one of our most recent successes, I think, of of moving a person, the worst of the worst, let's say, out of certain act. Uh, what was it? Probably about two months ago, maybe less. A good example of that is with Jesse. We were we have with our needle exchange stuff that I know a lot of the churches, of course, have people who are not doing. One of our most badass in the street trash drug addicts, who most people on the street are scared of, they're going to beat the crap out of them, out, out of them for something or other. Um, through our engagement by entering his darkest places, the things he's most ashamed about and embarrassed about, through engagement with the needle exchange, so getting clean equipment and stuff like to to him, provided an opportunity to see that humanity growing more in him. Because he stopped Jesse through like threw his arms up in the middle of the road, stopped Jesse in the middle of the road, and then just started crying in Jesse's arms about his life. So we need individuals who can walk into that darkness and we can train them how to get there and to utilize the tools at our, at our, at our disposal to make those connections. Not everyone's called to that. I get that, but we are called to do something. one of you represent a different organization and a different thing, would it not be more beneficial for all of you and all other for, um, groups who, who deal with addiction and homelessness and mental health to pool your resources and get together to deal with this issue more fully over time? That's actually something that's been increasing over the years. Um, I would say the last two years I think we've seen a more intentional movement towards uh, uh, connectivity between agencies. Because everybody here is going to represent a different spectrum of approach. You know, from abstinence to us enablers who are completely evil. Um, who also support abstinence, by the way. Uh, but then we, we're starting to realize that we have to intentionally engage. And so we are seeing more of that happening in our community. Because Abbotsford, say 10 years ago, was silo way. Like everybody was just off doing their own things, completely negating their neighbors. We're seeing a definite intentional move towards more collaborative. I wasn't originally asked to be on this panel of a man by the name of Jim Burkenshaw was my brother. He's um, been involved in that, it's called City of Refuge, working with that sort of Christian News Network to try to increase everybody's engagement and cooperation so that different pieces are happening and coordinated. I don't know whether everybody had to be in one organization. You might not always agree. Um, but if we can think, we can respect that you know they have a responsibility, we do, and if we are cooperating and perhaps referring back and forth, uh, in a sense, blessing what we see the, the people's call to do, that may be the most effective if it is cooperating and not fighting. With the I agree. You know, cooperation and working together is really important. Um, churches are, um, you know, there are a lot of churches involved in the city of refuge, and I think that's been. Um, a great asset to the community. I know Ward thinks, you know, they maybe should be a little more radical, but, you know, I, I, I really respect Ward's position, but I also see that there's, there are other positions that we have to respect. Um, so I think, you know, working together is critical. Um, and, and, you know, non-government or government agencies, non-profits who aren't faith-based are working together more and more with churches. And churches are, you know, also engaging with, with nonprofits, um, you know the warm zone is hugely supported by by a number of churches, physically, you know, being there, and also financially. So I, it's beginning to happen, um, and I think that's one of the ways that we need to work in our community. The question you raise is a good one. It's a big one, and I think that's why we need comprehensive, and uh, that's why uh, 
need for a housing strategy that encourages the various partners to, to work together in ways that they can and, to be, and, and there are advantages for doing so and there are incentives for doing so, whether it's through charitable, you know, charitable tax receiving or government grants or shared resources. It's an awful load for anyone. I feel sorry for Abbotsford who has to deal with this issue all by itself without benefit from the province or without benefit from the federal government. And uh, I, I know it's uh, uh, just, just anecdotally I want to share. I got a call just a couple of days ago. Somebody who knows I live here near Abbotsford. They're very much aware how, how could this vote have taken place in the Bible Belt where people should be driven by the call for compassion. Thank you very much. Yes, one more question. So certainly we know that, um, like any population, homeless people, are, it's not a homogeneous population. But I think that if somebody were to listen to this conversation, they might conclude that the only people who are impacted by homelessness, in this town at least, are men. And I'm wondering if there's something systemically negligent going on in that. Um, so I'm hoping that somebody can speak to the unique experiences of women who are homeless or marginally housed and how those issues are being addressed, not just in a afterthought sort of way, but really as a, as a forefront issue on the issue of homelessness. So again, again speak in depth about that for Salvation Army right now, but what I can say is over the last couple of weeks, as we've, as we've been looking internally, we have started to address specifically uh, the needs of women in the community and the marginalized women in our community. We're not exactly sure what that's going to look like yet, but we, we have started a women's ministry. I will say that that is one of the things that we've started to push forward rather quickly at the Centre of Hope. I know there are a couple of places in Abbotsford where uh, there are, it is safe, affordable housing for women, I think. Christine Lamb, resident, and the Firth residents both deal with women. So they have been that battle. Uh, yeah, I was going to mention, you know, that Christine Lamb, as well as the Firth residents, which is run by Elizabeth Fry Society, and um, Penny's Place, which is run by the Women's Resource Society. So there are a number of um, supportive housing units for women and you know funnily enough those have not attracted the kind of um, criticism um, in our community when they were when they were built they kind of went under the radar because women and kids you know it's hard to to knock them right Joshua House works with men and it makes sense in a house to have men or women I mean works with uh, life recovery which is women in recovery obviously a big need there to houses. And the problems are so interconnected. Um, I've had the most thanks from somebody about Josh House Ministry from the wife of one of them, who she in a sense, she and her kids got her back. So I mean, but that's you know so it is interconnected back and forth. Each organization has to work with what it, who it can and recognizing that's part of the larger picture as well. Yeah there's just uh, not enough anywhere. <laughs> Simply put, I mean, we need more women's stuff, we need more men's stuff, we need more youth stuff. There's lots of problems, we just have to get creative and just get to the island. Well, thank you for your awesome questions and thank you everybody for your enthusiasm on this topic. It's a real topic. I think, you know, to, to walk away from this, I go, well, um, each, each person on the street, each person that we meet has a story and, and let's not be afraid to engage in that story and see where that takes us. So, one quick thing. If you have any more questions, I got cards. Let's go for coffee. Just give me a call. All right? So, thank you. Thank you very, very much. We want to thank each member on the panel. We are just are very honored that you would come and have this uh, conversation and dialogue with us. And on behalf of the committee, we'd like to present you with a small token of our appreciation and also to let you know that a 